Thank you, Stacey. No, it's, uh, you know, most of the time, you can just, I can eat my own cooking and you can just go and Google me. You don't have to have things like that happen. Because, uh, you know, we always tell people, go Google people. And, you know, you can Google me and then, you know, your perception, whatever, your, whatever you think of me there is, is your perception is probably true. You know, so if, if, if there's something on Google that shouldn't be there, then I've done something wrong and it is like it is. Thank you, Nick. So, <laughs> okay. so thank you to Regenesis Business School for having me here this evening. It's really great uh, to see a different audience and also to talk about a new subject, which is open leadership. Now, open leadership, has anyone even heard remotely of open leadership before? No? Okay. Well, that's great. So hopefully I can introduce you to the concept of open leadership. It's not that typical sort of leadership that you found in the manuals, because it's not theoretical leadership. And we'll unpack it for you, and you can understand a little bit more about open leadership and probably the style that you might want to adopt for yourself. I think that the, the interesting thing about theoretical leadership is if you listen to people talk about theoretical leadership, they'll, and I saw a little YouTube video the other day, and they show you all these different types of leadership that you'll find in your textbook, and then they go and describe it. So it's those typical you know, situational leadership, transformational leadership, and all those other funny things that you find. And then they go and make this statement, which was me for, was the most profound. They go, now, once you've understood all of these, you can decide which one works for you. And all I could think about, that's like watching Formula One. And you know, there's a McLaren, and there's a Ferrari, and then there's some other cars, there's a Mercedes or those sort of things, and now you've decided that's the one that won, and now you can choose the winner for you, that works for you, and then you get in it and you drive it. Are you going to win the race? Well, that's pretty much like theory leadership. You can learn about it, but there's very little you can do with it. Uh, and that's my observation of what's happened in leadership. That's why we sit with, um, when, we talk, when we're on the leadership panel, and Richard Angus is here as well this evening from the leadership panel, and we talk about this trust deficit, and how did the trust deficit come about? Well, it was probably because we were trying to put theory onto people. You know, People don't like systems. People like love. It's simple, you know. Try, try, you know, and what I wanted you to understand as we start is that leadership is pretty simple. Because the easiest way, if you don't understand how to deal with someone, think of that person as a child. Right? So don't think of them as this horrible person that you're trying to lead or trying to influence or do whatever. Look at them as a child. And if they're impossible, we have impossible children as well. Okay, there's some heads shaking in the audience here. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> but we also have good children, and we have children that were once impossible, and we've actually influenced them to become good children. And you can do the same with people. That's what leadership's about. So leadership is very similar to parenting. It's not any different. It's just that we put a whole lot of words and jargon onto things, and we complicate it. So I'm going to try and simplify everything. And if I use big words, then you must shout at me, because we don't like big words, because our poor brains don't understand big words. That's the problem. So we try to simplify everything so that we can understand it and it can go in, as opposed to the concept sort of sticking somewhere out there and some word blocking the concept from entering our brains. I'm not a neuroscientist. I've just had a brain transplant. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm, I might think differently to you. That's probably because the wires aren't working so well. You know, people often ask me, am I ADD or ADHD? Well, <clears throat> all I, I don't know. I've never been tested. But what I can tell you is my mom was wise enough to teach me how to read and write and do the ABCs and all that before I started school. So it put me ahead of the curve and no one ever checked. <laughs> okay, honestly. 
That's the honest truth. That's what my mom did. So who knows if I am or not? Actually, it doesn't matter. Okay. I know I'm a bit different, but no one's ever checked. Okay. So <laughs> let's move on. Now, you know, there's a funny thing about when we look at, at leadership and, and the way we communicate. And, and in my book, when I wrote about what I called social communication, which wasn't necessarily the way we communicate online. It was just the way we communicate as people. Because we're social animals and we're sort of hardwired to connect with people, I looked at how we communicate and how we want to communicate and how we want it to be communicated to and how we should be communicating with people. Now, in the old days, in the good old days, when there were still big animals and saber-toothed tigers and those sort of things running around, a leader was an important person because the leader was the one who would defend us against the, the danger. And we'd look after the leader and he would basically sacrifice his life so that we could carry on existing. Now things changed a bit. And where did they change? Well, when we were in the subsistence world, and we were all sort of doing our own little bit of farming and those type of things. And we were doing quite happily, mind you. Suddenly, the machine arrived. And people realized that they could f make things very quickly. But the problem is, when they, when they found these machines, they needed workers to work on the machines. And they invented school. Once they had invented school, they realized that school was not only a good place to teach you how to be a good machine worker, but basically a good consumer as well. And all you needed to do then was leave your brain at the door and come in with your hands. And we realized that at the moment, that idea doesn't work for us because we actually need people to think. We need very little with their hands. So we have this sort of disconnect. But we found that the system approach, because of the way the machine needed to be looked after, we have this micromanagement problem coming through, which is definitely not leadership. So when someone micromanages, they kind of miss the big picture, because it is micromanagement. There's nothing to do with leadership at all. They miss a vision, and they miss how to communicate with people. And that's what we come out of. Now, we'll try to look at a few different ways. If you look at this little picture, which I quite liked, Never mind him at the bottom there, but there was your farmer, there's your factory worker, here's your typical maybe civil servant or corporate worker, but here's a doctor with a paintbrush and a palette in his hand, and he's just doing something different. So this picture spoke to me, and I thought, well, that's sort of where we want to be. Because the problem comes is that we also kind of believe that what we do at work is separate to what we do at home. And what we do at home is separate to what we do when we go to the sports field or when we go to our place of worship. But we realize that we're just one person all the time. So when we looked at personal branding and those sort of things, we realize that your personal brand, you don't need a separate Twitter account, for instance, to be on, at work. And then when you go home, you've got something different. You're one person, so represent yourself as one person. That's all that's important, because when I meet you, I want to see the whole you, not the person you pretend to be. Where do we learn that? Well, we learn that from meeting people. You know, When you met your husband or your wife or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your partner, you, you were looking for the realistic person. You weren't looking for the pose. We know everyone can hold a pose, and there's some people that can hold a pose up to six months long. <laughs> Honestly, we've... <laughs> but you want them to drop the pose and you want to find out who they really are. So that's what, that's what we, want. we want. The people we work with, the people we meet, we want them to show up in their authenticity and their truth. We don't want them to pose because we, we're suspect of that. And the reason why we are suspect of that is because 80% of our communication is not verbal, it's not body language, it's simple, limbic, emotional communication. And that's what makes our communication powerful. 
See, there's a, what I'm going to propose to you this evening is that we need to think. And I'm going to use a few examples. The problem is that we all think. Do you all agree that we think? Can we agree on that one? Okay. There's a problem, however, is that we don't think about what we think about when we think. Okay? Now, it's not entirely wrong because 80% of what comes into our lives is simple propaganda. It needs to be there. If it's not there, we think about things we shouldn't be thinking about. That's what happens when you keep completely quiet. When, you, when, the, when a problem arises in a department or an organization or a country, and instead of keeping on the normal communication, you suddenly go hush on everything. Then nature bores the vacuum and it goes like, oh, what's happening there? Why? And then everyone starts looking at something they shouldn't start looking at because you've actually forced them to look there because you haven't been communicating the normal. Uh, there was an old story. I remember when we first started crisis communication, and I handled a lot of crisis communication, but everyone said if there's a crisis, you keep your channels quiet. You don't do anything. No. The problem is that when there's a, if you keep quiet and everyone wonders what's happening, or they say, well, we haven't heard from those guys. Must, something must be happening in that department, in that bank, or whatever organization it is. So you've got to keep everything as normal as possible and address the problems not as if they're problems, but just another opportunity. So it's a different way of thinking. And that's why we need to think. You see, if I was true to you this evening, which I haven't been true to you, because if, if what I'm telling you, if everything's about communication, I should have just simply stood up here and said, what would you like to hear from me? So let me put that question to you. What would you like to hear from me? That was the end of my presentation, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you like to hear from me? <laughs> open leadership. So what is your perception of open leadership as you ask the question? Because there's, a, there's an interesting statement that we, we don't ask any question that we don't know the answer to. So there, I've put you on a spot. Transparency. Transparency. Any other ideas? Seeing that the gentleman's asked the question, let's put it to the floor. What would you say open leadership is? Effective communication? Collaborative? Okay. Do what you expect other people to do? Empowerment? Transparent? Everything is not closed. That's a very good, very interesting statement, that one. Yeah, we all, we all get to that one. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Engaged. Clear direction. So if we had to look at clear direction, we'd have to ask good questions, wouldn't we? Because that, that's where it all starts. If we... I think often we over-communicate things. We give people, you know, if you have to, one of the definitions of open is give them everything. But that's, not, that's true and not true at the same time because they don't know what everything is and you might confuse people. So you always have to communicate on their understanding. So find out what their understanding is and then communicate to that understanding and then add to it if necessary. But allow them to keep asking the questions and give them what they need, not what you think they need. And that's our biggest problem with communication is we keep communicating what we think is cool about us and our companies, but that's not what the people want to hear because we haven't listened to them. And 80% of our success, interestingly enough, comes from listening. And, you, I mean, some of you will be married to people who talk a lot. And you don't do any talking. You know that. And they think you've got a fantastic relationship. Well, you have because 80% of your success is listening. So as long as you're listening to them, everything's happy. You know, try to turn it the other way around. You might have a problem, but that's just how life is. So we've, we've got to continuously listen and ask questions. So 
I want to pose a question to you this evening. And thank you for your input. What is this? Foundation brush. Okay. An oil painting brush. A tool. Okay. All right. Now, it can be, it can be anything. Quite correct. Now, if... Now you, you've, you've got the answer, and your answer is 100% correct, whatever it was. If a four-year-old comes to you and asks you, what is this? What do you tell them? What's that? <laughs> Go put it back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So what do you actually tell them? You just do you give them the answer? There we are. Okay. So you can give them the answer. Unfortunately, the answer is not very emotionally intelligent. Okay? Why? Because immediately when you give someone the answer, you've made yourself right and them wrong. If their answer was not exactly the same as yours, you're in conflict with that person. All you do is you simply ask them, what do they think it is? And then what do you think the child will tell you? What is this? Pain brush. So what are the options here? What, what could this be? Could, could mean many things to a child, yeah. So they might even say to you that they think that this item is a tree. Okay. And then what do you say then? That's interesting. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so how, how would you approach the answer then? Other than it's interesting. Because they, they, you, you, unfortunately, the interesting, although it is interesting, okay, you've, you've almost closed the dialogue there. That's sort of like a rhetorical statement. So you want, to open, you want to open statements so that you can get the conversation going. What are you going to say? Why does it look like a tree? Explain to me why you think this is a tree. And they'll probably say to you, well, it's got sort of wood here, like that thing, and then it goes big at the top like a tree does, and that's how they draw trees. And what have you done in this process? And this is so important when asking people questions and interacting with people. At no stage of, the, of, the, of this whole thing, you just say to them, you can understand why they think it's a tree. And then mom calls this a makeup brush. So you haven't said, no, you're wrong, it's not a tree, this is a makeup brush. You haven't made them wrong in the process. So they walk away, still feeling the love, okay? So what, and then you haven't made them wrong. So there's still a possibility. So why is it so important for us to feel the love? Yes. Okay. That's, you, you've got to look at it, even if you are a man and even if you are the typical oak, you know? All right? You've still got to try and put some emotion into your communication. And I will get that, get that to you later. Okay, sorry. I'm tongue tied there. We will get to emotions later and why they're so important. So, communication is what it's all about. It's about asking the right questions and probably asking the right question at the right time. Okay? And not just assuming everything. So I need to tell you a little story. Around about, it was prior to 2010, I used to work at Kailami. I was a high-speed driving instructor on Kailami Racetrack. And what happens there is that people would arrive on the day they go into a little lecture room where they get taught the dynamics of driving. It's a bit like leadership theory, because you can't drive a car by theory. You have to sit in the car to drive it. But anyway, they teach them the, these ideas, and then they come out of this lecture room, they get put in a car with the instructor, and we take them on a little lap around Kailami, which they assume at that stage is fast. So in my car on this particular day, I got these very three big Afrikaans lawyers from Pretoria. And I assumed the guy who sat next to me must have been their boss. And they put in on their seatbelts, and as they put on their seatbelts, we pull off. 
So you go down the pit lane, and you're still going relatively slow at that stage. And this big guy next to me says, yes, you must be a really good driver if you're an instructor here. So I go, sir, well, you know, the problem is that all men think they're good lovers and good drivers. <laughs> but the only problem is they haven't been told they're bad. And while they think about this, you see, they didn't ask the question at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> now they in their belts, they can't get them off, and uh, we're around the track, you know. And I probably went a little bit faster than I should have with it, just to sort of show them that, you know, no one had ever told me I was a bad driver. Because that's the honest truth, even though no one ever checks what well, everyone assumes, okay? Now, I mean, maybe we had to be good drivers to be there, but no one ever checked. And often we don't check because we assume. I mean, who... We, who was ever employed here and they asked you if you could type? Did anyone ask you that? No, they just assume you can. You see, we don't even ask the right questions when we employ people. So, that, you know, and that sort of makes me think why people, leaders are bad or why we assume leaders are bad because they've, we assume that they've employed us for our skills. Right? I mean... We, we've just been employed as the director of finance or something like that. We, we must have been good at finance. But then if we were that good and they wanted to pay us, you know, the four, ten bar a year, whatever they want to pay us, okay. Oh, Rich, you know. And, no, no, I mean, he's shaking his head. He said, no, Rich, it's 20 bar, don't worry. <laughs> okay. If they want to pay us that much, then they assume we have the skills. We can all say, yeah, if they want to pay us 20 bar, they, we must have the skills. Yet when we start the job, they tell us what to do. Okay? That's really weird. That's honestly weird. Why did they pay us so much? Why did we have to go through this heavy interviewing process if all we had to do it was their way anyway? Why didn't they just get a 20 more staff, then, you know, pay them less, skill them in the skills that they need instead of going to all this process of like, no, you need two degrees for this position and you need 10 years experience. Why do we do that? That's bizarre. But it is. That's what's happening. And then we wonder why there's problems. So ne next time you... And I know the problem. We've got HR. And HR gives us these people that we're supposed to work with, and we, we probably never could choose. I don't know. But maybe we should be working closer together. And maybe open leadership is a bit working closer together with our people around us so that we can make sure we get the right people so that we can get the job done properly. Oh, just in case, if you are taking notes to ask me questions later, write down your answers, your questions now. Okay, because if you're trying to remember them, you'll forget them. Okay? Because I'm disruptive. Okay? Your brain, you'll think you're holding something, I will make sure that it changes it in your brain. Okay? And, and I do it very subtly. So don't worry. But just write your question down. Because your question would have changed, and maybe you want your first initial thought answered and not the one that develops over the evening. See, leading is all about action. Who would agree? Okay. If it's not action, what is it then? Just words. Then it's just theory and those sort of things. What we do in school is so lively, I can't hear a word you say. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they say leadership is about three things. Example, example, and show them. That's what leadership is. <laughs> All right. So, and it's always, what is the action the example that could be followed? See, there was, there, I remember when I wrote my books, intention was quite big. Yes, intention's good, but intention without action is just a dream. So get the intention right, because that's what's going to help you and motivate yourself to move along. But without action, you're not moving anywhere. 
Because then there's no consistency, there's just a thought. There might be a consistent thought, and that, that might be good enough to kind of like put you in the starting blocks, but you have to get out of the starting blocks as well. So it's all about action. Now, here's an interesting saying, and you've probably all heard this one. Okay, who hasn't seen this quote before by Einstein? Okay, haven't seen it before. Okay, so we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used to create the problems with. And we go, oh, there, oh, yeah, okay. Who, now, coming back to my original question, who's ever thought about this one? Because we've all seen it, or now we've seen it, and when you see it, how do you think about this? So you now we have to think differently. Have you, ever, have you ever thought about what it takes to think differently? Because we are all sheeple after all. We've been through the same system. So you know, I remember when the State of the Nation address came out and everyone was moaning about the State of the Nation address. I wrote a blog and I said, please don't, please, you know, please don't think that you can be critical about what happened at the State of the Nation last night because it's actually happening in your company. And it's happening in your lives. Why? Because you went to the same school. Okay? doesn't matter if you went to the good school or the poor school or wherever you went to school. You'd probably only, only be safe to think differently if you didn't go to school. Okay? <laughs> Honestly. Because you, you, you might be thinking differently. Otherwise, you're thinking like everyone else is thinking. And that you, you're hoping you're going to be successful by thinking like everyone else is thinking. And we all got the same problems. We're all trying to solve it the same way. No wonder there's no innovation. There's no creativity. Because, and it's pretty simple. And I want to show you how simple it is to unlock this side of your brain. What is the opposite of a leader? Come on, say it. Follower. Is it a follower? See, it is a follower because when you went to school, there was a dictionary. You know, and you were clever if you could read a dictionary. But there was also another book. It's the opposite of a dictionary. What's it called? It's like thesaurus. And in the thesaurus, it says that the opposite of a leader is a follower. Hmm. Sure. So, who went to school? <laughs> okay. So, yo. You see how you were brainwashed. So what is the opposite of a leader? Come on. Think now. I'll give you some moments. A what? A lazy bum. What are other other things? Just a person. Just a person? No, 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 don't think work. No, because remember I told you leadership starts with your family. Starts with, if you understand how to lead. An early adopter, the opposite to a leader. Oh, you're just more effective. That's probably what you are. Okay. A gypsy. Okay. Well, at least you're alternative. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on. Have you? Who can think? What? what? Yes. Someone that's willing to be led. Yo. Yo. <laughs> I don't know. There's many of them. How's your husband? Is you willing, you willing to be led? <laughs> So there, there was someone with no action, lazy person. What do you think about the options of no action, lazy person? How does that work for you? No? Why? Opposite, remember? Yeah. Hmm? Supporter. Hmm? 
Okay, so I just want to go back to this slide here, just to remind you. Leading is all about action. So take your question and say, where's the action in my question? So a supporter, okay, there's some action in that. Resistor, there's some action in that. Some action in that. So you just you just another a leader in the resistance as opposed to the allies, you know, that sort of thing. So there's action. Passive. Passive would be yeah, okay. Do you see we, do you see how we're understanding the problem now? Because if you don't understand what a leader does, then anything could be the opposite. What the dictionary says could be the opposite. But if you've got action, then the person with action is more a leader than he is a lazy person or inactive. Now I'll explain. Yeah, but have you heard about leading your own life? <laughs> so there's a, you're a leader of your own life. See, because then if they did find you, you, you know, No, but that's for you to decide. <laughs> Nick, have you got something to say? Well, until he finds a follower. <laughs> okay? So remember, we're not, we're not, we're not differentiating here, and, and I shouldn't actually use that as an example, because basically... You can lead without followers, because it's self-leadership. Okay, at least you know where you're going, and you go in there. Okay, otherwise you're just an intentional leader, which is the same as all those other funny styles of leadership. Okay, what is that? There's no action in it. Okay, knowing the theory about driving the F1 car, and driving the F1 car is a bit different. Knowing which one will win, so you might know that this style in this situation might be the right style, but it might not be your style, and it might not be something you might be able to put into action. You're probably getting nowhere. So it's all about action. So what I'm doing here is unlocking your mind to think about different things, because it's, this won't be the only question that comes your way in life. What is the opposite? What I've realized is that if you want to understand somebody, understand why they do the, in the obvious, and then ask yourself, but if they're doing this, what would the opposite action be, or the opposite thought even, of what they're doing? Huh? Because then we can understand things. makes it simpler for us. Because life's about simplification, not complication. That's why I ask you, so if there's a... If there's leadership and the opposite is about action, then you've, you see, because why do we ask this question? I don't want to ask you the question to say, put up your hands, those of you who think leaders or not. Okay? Because the problem is I've asked the question incorrectly. The way I should ask the question is, are you a lazy person or a procrastinator, or are you a leader? Now, that's a fair question, because you can say, uh, you see, because when your, your answer was very much the generalization, because we, we take everything in generalization. So are you a leader? And then your mind goes, yes, I'm a leader at home. I'm not a leader at work because they don't give me an opportunity and I'm a leader here on the sports field because I'm a good soccer player and those sort of things. And you kind of like group this whole thing together. So in the situation, you know, situational leadership, here we go. Okay, in the situation, are you a procrastinator or are you doing some action to be the leader? And that's the question you need to ask yourself. Or ask someone if you're asking them the leadership question. Or any question for that matter, instead of asking them the obvious, are you a leader? You say, I understand that the opposite of leader is procrastinator. Here's a line. Tell me how you're doing on the leadership line. And some people would say, well, I'm about 50%. 
So if you're, and, and you say, but I'm not a leader, I'm a follower. So I didn't ask you if you're a leader or a follower. I asked you, are you a procrastinator or a leader? How good are you in the action? So where along this line as a follower are you? Are you more towards the leader? Are you following and the leader, if you say you're a follower? Is your action showing that you're actually following? Or is your action showing that you're sitting still and becoming lazy? So that you can then unlock your mind and decide where you're going and what's working for you. So that's just a, a, the way to kind of like unlock your mind. We haven't found a better way at the moment. So that's what I'm proposing is the best way to look at situations. And there's many answers. So, that, you know, as I've just popped up procrastinator there, but there's lazy person, there's inactive and all those things. And you'll know which word works in any particular situation to understand the opposite of what's happening. So this whole concept of um, open leadership was Charlene Lee from the Ultimeter Group in America. She first wrote a book about a year or two ago now on open leadership. And her concepts of open leadership was be open, be transparent, and be authentic. Now, yes, we can agree, those are great things to, to be open. However, a friend of mine, Thomas Power in the UK, Thomas realized that while he was working in corporate, is that most corporates had institutional type thinking, which was closed, very selective, and very controlling. Okay? So... And, and, and often, because of the type of organization that you're in, that's how it had to operate. But he also realized that most of the people weren't communicating with each other because they were so scared to communicate out of those lines that they were put into that it wasn't really working. So it took him 10 years to discover the following, what he called open, random, and supportive, and which is something that I kind of liked his idea because... That's where it was really open leadership. It was random and supportive. And I'll, I'll try and pack a few of those ideas for you this evening as well. So it's called Oars. And you'll notice that on Twitter we, we put leaderships. You know, I don't know how you pronounce that word, but it's leaders, leader, oars, ship, up. Okay. So, you know, I didn't do school well. Okay. My, you see, my mother taught me everything before I went to school, so I didn't need to learn anything else. I was a bad student. Anyway. <laughs> so open leadership, as I said earlier, it's as open as it possibly can be without being ridiculous. Okay? You know, you, you ask the people what they understand. The child comes to you, says to you, what is this? You ask them what do they think it is. And that's how you dialogue with people. Because why is it so important to ask people questions? It's because you're showing them you care for them. And that's what le you know, leadership is nothing else but serving others. Nothing, there's no title in this. Okay, and that's what I liked about open leadership. Because as soon as you have a title, well, you've... In, you've actually failed the emotional intelligence test if you've subscribed to a title. Okay? Now, how do I explain that? If I ask you, are you emotionally intelligent? And you say, yes, you're not. <laughs> you know why? Because the first rule of emotional intelligence is give up the need to be right. So if you told me you are, you haven't got there yet. So, you know, go back to the drawing board, a little bit more humble, a little bit more introspection, and you'll get there. Because it's, it's basically as easy as that. It's just checking yourself in the moment. That's what emotional intelligence is. There's a whole lot of intelligences. And, you know, I, I think if we have to mention spiritual intelligence, a lot of people conjure up an idea that that might be religious, or something like that. No, it's got nothing else to do it other than it's a balance of your IQ and your emotional intelligence, and you've been able to balance those two. And that's literally what spiritual intelligence is. If you, if you did think it was religious, I can put this into the pot for you. 
is that you're not spiritually, if you want to look at it in a religious way, if you're not spiritually intelligent if you can't go into another man's church who isn't the same religion as you. Okay, that's not spiritual intelligence either. So you should be able to eat the chicken and spit out the bones. Okay, because you know where your belief is and nothing is going to change you. Okay, if, you, if you're not at that level, understand you, not spiritually intelligent, then don't try it. Okay, that's literally what it means. Okay, so... Spiritual intelligence, working with it too. Left and right brain theory, not very clever, unfortunately. Because what we've realized is that you need your left side of the brain to work with the right side of the brain. Okay? So even if we look at the accountants of the world, and Richard, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we know about creative accounting. They have to use the other side of the brain. Otherwise, they wouldn't get the reports out. The reports wouldn't look very good, and they wouldn't make any sense because we communicate with people on an emotional level. And yes, your finances are quite emotional to you, so they do communicate with you. All right. Just, you know, if you've got lots of finances, good emotional feeling, a little bit of finances, sort of bad emotional feeling. So, yeah, that's, that's my... I'll leave the finance now, eh? Okay, so... <laughs> Right. Now, if you're not being open, you must be hiding something. And we kind of like, no, you know, the, the, what we can learn from current affairs is that if they say you stole 10 million dollars, don't deny it. <laughs> okay? Because, you know, honestly, we, we live in a connected world. If you have, you know, and I'm sure that, you know, if you, unless you are completely, completely conscious, you know, no conscience at all, okay, then you wouldn't have heard that you might be implicated. If you knew you took the money, then you must know you're implicated, and you better listen carefully so that you're informed, more informed than others. You know, and I think that's just basic human sort of behavior. Okay, we don't act stupid. We know what's happening especially if it involves us. And understand that if we notice in that, of the people that are doing that, it happens everywhere in life. Okay? Our children know it before we tell them. They're much more clever than we are. Okay? They know exactly what's happening. So trying to hide something, trying to be this closed person and hoping no one's going to find out, they know already. It just needs to be confirmed. So, moving towards the open, because we forced to in the first place, because of social media these days, everything's there. It's better to move into the open than to try be this closed person. So let's look at open and and what is this? You know, th th for me the interesting thing was I had a a, a client and. I was consulting with him, and I, didn't, I, I fortunately didn't spend too much time consulting with him because you'll know why now. I get to this guy, and he invites me into his office. I get into the office. His secretary brings me in, opens the door. Behind me, the door gets closed, and I sit down. So, a few minutes later, there's a little knock on the door, and the poor little secretary goes in, Sir, would you like some tea? And then he goes, yes, please, and what would you like? And I say, I'll, I'll have some coffee, thank you. And then the poor little secretary closes the door again and then walks out and eventually we get our tea. And, we say, and after all this, and I'm noticing this, he goes, you know, I'm a good CEO. I've got an open door policy. <laughs> oh. now, like, the first thing I have to do is look at the door. It's like, whoa. <laughs> so no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> So, <laughs> you really did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that's why they force people now to have open plan offices and no doors and all those sort of things because of people like him. You know? But honestly, you, be careful of how you see yourself. Okay? And you know, if, you, if you're wondering, okay? and as I always tell people, I, I speak to these big corporations, I, go, I sit at the board of directors and I'm talking to them. 
And I go, yeah, halfway through, I go, you know, guys, I honestly don't know why you paid me to be here today. Because all this stuff I've told you already, your wife's told you for free at home. <laughs> Promise you. Okay. So save yourself money, okay, and listen to your partners. Because I can promise you there's, there's a problem. If they're not being honest with you, it's probably because you haven't allowed them to be honest with you. So think about the way you interact with people. Are you listening or are you doing all the talking? If you're doing all the talking, there's a good chance that they can't talk because you're doing all the talking, you're not doing any listening. You know, dealing with relationships and those sort of things, when, you, when the person arrives at the counselor, okay, all you need to do is listen to them. And then you realize that these people have never been listened to properly in their lives before. That's how sad it is. People will tell you everything if you're prepared to listen to them. Most of the time, we never listen to them. So, you know, that's the, for me, that's the first start of being open. Just listen. 80% of your success. Just listen. Make sure you're listening to someone. And don't listen so that you can interrupt them. Listen so that you can understand them. Ask them, what else would you like to tell me? That's how you can start being a leader. You know, the interesting thing is, if, you, if you've ever wondered what your purpose is in life, I won't ask you the question. I'll put you out of your agony right now. Okay, your purpose is to make a difference in the lives of others. It's as simple as that. Whoever you meet, and you can start at home, you know? You don't have to wait to meet people. You've got people at home that are needing a bit of you. You know, they want you to show up in your authenticity, as Charlene was talking about there, because that's part of it. They want, they want to know that you are true to who they think you are. Because often we have perceptions about people and you realize that they haven't done their marketing very well. You know, marketing is just handling perceptions. That's all marketing is. No big trick. But it's a big trick because how did you handle those perceptions? So did, you, did people connect with you? Have you allowed them to connect with you? Have you been vulnerable? You know, vulnerable is a power. It's not a weakness. And maybe, you, you know, sometimes you need to explore that because it'll make you a better person. If you're a better person, you automatically become a better leader. So that's the, the simple part of open. There's a few words that I threw around here on open. So open doors there for the, the good old CEO. Be open to criticism. You know, I've tweeted before that I've learned more from people criticizing me than I've learned from anyone else. And it doesn't mean that it's someone big. I've learned criticisms from people with seven followers. Okay, honestly, because you, you don't look at their followers, because I don't know what this thing is about followers. People seem to think that someone with followers is more influential than someone. No, they're a person, they're unique, and they've got something to add to life. So listen to everybody. You don't have to l take in what everyone tells you, but listen to them. See what they're saying, and try and get something from it. You know, sometimes the chicken's very bony, and there's a little bit of chicken, but that little bit of chicken that comes on those bones is very nourishing. So look for it. Don't waste your time. And be open to spending more time with people, because I think that the problem is that we don't connect long enough with people. We don't show them, you know, imagine we've, we've got a 15-minute meeting, okay? Now, 15-minute meeting basically means... You're going to talk for seven and a half minutes, I'm going to talk for seven and a half minutes. And that's the agreement. So we know, you've got to say as much as you can, I'm going to say as much as we can. We'll never ever go deep there. Never. We know, it's just a dangerous place to go deep. But just, I, I was listening to a guy, and he, and he was actually, he's the um, chief designer of, um, for Mr. Price. He, do, he does all their branding. And uh, Neville was saying, he sits down with a client, and he says, they say, how much time do you want? He says, all the time. You don't, you don't stop me. I want to meet you, and we're going to talk. And then we're going to talk, and we're going to talk, and we're going to talk. And when we and when we've both decided that we depleted, we can go home. 
So do you want to meet me at 8 o'clock in the morning or do you want to meet me at 4 in the afternoon? Just depends when you want to go to bed. Okay? Because <laughs> he wants to understand you. He wants to connect with you and he wants you as a client for life. He doesn't just want you as a fly by night. Now, it's not always practical, that. But think of that in your relationship. How much time have you spent with your partner? You can't get it right with your partner, who's this dear person you spend the rest of your life with. How are you ever going to get it right with someone who you supposedly want to lead? So you've got to let time, you know that, that old nonsense about the, the quality versus quantity thing? You know that, uh, do you know the story? You know you've heard it? Okay, just forget it. Okay, it doesn't work. Okay, because quantity is the new quality. That's it. All right? If you, I can promise you. All right, you don't believe me? Go home to your, night, to your partner tonight. Look at them, stare them in the eyes for five minutes. Go. So, how was that for quality? I'm going to slap you. I'm going to slap you. So all that's going to happen. See, it doesn't work. So, so when you hear things, and that's what I ask you to think about what you think about when you think. Hear something, put it through the test. And it's a relationship test every single time. Okay? Anything else is irrelevant. If it doesn't get through the relationship test, discard it. Okay? Because leadership's all about relationships. If you can't put it through that test, leave it. Don't waste your time. Okay? Do you understand that one? Yeah. Okay. So be open to disruption, new ideas, transformation, and all those sort of things. We'll get to transformation in a moment as well. So random. Like, so random. You know, people go, what are we going to speak about? Well, imagine Neville coming into your office, and you ask Neville, what are you going to speak about? He says, I don't know. We've got a lot of time. You just talk. And that's random. Because if we allowed people to be a little bit more random, they'd probably be more innovative. They'd be more collaborative. Because we, you know, there's an example that I use. You're having Sunday lunch. Your mother says to you, and, you know, clear the dining room for us. And there was, you know, Ten extra chairs had to be brought in. The dining room table had to be extended, the whole thing. And it's just a mess. Where do you start? Anywhere. You had a nice mother. <laughs> I'm serious. Because certain personalities would want you to take the dirty dishes off first. And then bring, you know, the, that's the big plates. They go first. Then the smaller plates. And they all get nicely packed. See, if you don't do it that way, you're in problem. You've got trouble. Okay? You had a nice mother, Richard. You really did. Okay? <laughs> sort of reminds me about the time my, my son went on cricket tour. And um, they were at this sort of boarding school type of thing. And the food was terrible. And there was one little boy there, and he was eating all the food. <laughs> and my son looked at him, he goes, how can you eat that food? <laughs> he goes, your, this little boy who's eating all the food says, oh, your mothers must cook very well. So you, you need to be random. You need to be open to new ideas. You know, <laughs> um, I threw a few. Okay, the, just in, in terms of we have we have five primal needs as people. Okay, so if we're not sure how to be random with people, because some of us don't know how to be random. Okay, and we see this on social media. They do the same thing all the time, and, and we all probably fall into that trap. But the first thing you'd be random about is understand that people need to discover things. Okay, so give them something to discover. So this is kind of like dating 101. You know, they need to discover who you are, the directions, no's no, or yes is yes. 
whatever is applicable. Directions, rules, pla. Okay, disruption. So no is not always no. Okay, yet. Right, and then distraction. Okay, so how, how are you going to kiss them? Okay, because the, the, the interesting thing about the kiss, I wrote a blog post about this, and my blog post was titled, When Do We Kiss? It's about you and your customer. Okay, because you actually want to get the deal done. The problem is no one ever asks for the kiss. So there's a time when you find out all these things, and then you say, can we kiss? Okay, do you trust me enough now? Or if we don't want to kiss, then we need to move ourselves out of the situation and go find another client we can sell to. Okay? So you're waiting, you're looking for the kiss. Because that's what life's all about. It's not just about having friends and, you know, doing whatever we do with friends. We actually want some meaningful things in our life. And when it's a client, you know, we're obviously not going to kiss the client. But, the, you know, like we mentioned earlier, the, the, when the money comes into the bank account, that's like a nice kiss. You know, it's like it's happiness. It's happiness by the bank account, not happiness by the body. You know? <laughs> Fine. Okay. <laughs> and then we do need to declare things to people. You know, we do need to declare that we love them, that we appreciate them, we recognize them. So that's how to be random. There's a few other things here. So random hugs. Do you know, the energy in, in the room is a little bit down. Do you feel it? Ooh. No? Oh, okay. All right. So I, I, my first book was called Five Night Plan. Okay, and someone asked me, why is it called Five Night Plan? Because a five-day plan would sound too much like work. Mm. Okay. But in that book, I have to be very honest and ask for your forgiveness, I lied in that book. See, see, what I said in that book was we need five hugs a day to be normal. But unfortunately, you need 11 hugs a day to be normal. Okay, so who's had 11 hugs today? Okay, so stand up, stand up, hug each other, get those hugs up, 11 hugs, come on. Come on, yeah, yeah, come on. Let's start. Come on, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there, there we go. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Are you counting? Oh, no, no, 11. Ah. Oh, <laughs> <Got on. laughs> That's good. Okay, so, so, I, so I got about 12 hugs and one church hug. <laughs> you know what a church hug is? <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so yeah, let, let's be more random, okay. <laughs> supportive, um, supportive of others, their emotions, all those things, okay. Encourage others. Some people as we've heard, do not get encouraged at home. They, they live, even if they might be in a relationship, they might not be in a fulfilling relationship. And you might be the only person that ever listens to them. Whoever you are, wherever you are, think about others and support them. Because that's going to make all the difference. I mentioned the connected generation. And that's anyone who's, been, who's chosen to be connected. So it's not a generational thing. Okay? 
It's got nothing to do with your age. It's whether you chose to be connected or not. There's an interesting thing about this, this you know, and the HR people here will, will have known this, that this generational theory. Now have a look at these things and go like, 72% of the millennials would want it to be their own boss. If you're not a millennial, did you not think like that when you left school? You did. Hmm. They want flexible work times. My mother, when I was so high, was telling me about flexi time. Okay? So I don't know where the theory comes from. Okay, work-life integration. That's what I spoke about earlier. This whole thing about your work, your family. We've been doing it for years. So, you know, and then they come with a, with a theory of millennials. My theory about generational theory is it's bad management, and, and bad managers always need an excuse. So you help them with the excuse if you give them a theory like that. Then they can blame anything. In psychology circles, we call it the Hansi syndrome. <laughs> you know the Hansi syndrome? Okay, someone else made me do it. So if you give me a theory, I can say, I was taught that in a theory. Okay. So take ownership for things. Right? What do, you, what do you know to be true? So what have you been thinking about? How can you apply your own thinking to the situation? So don't look for the ideas that will confirm your thinking. That's sort of my mantra. You see, when we look at, even if we do look at these trends, okay, the trends only disrupt your thoughts. Don't follow the trends. Think about the trend. Think of how it applies, what it has taught you, and move swiftly along. Don't get stuck there. This is business culture. Okay, there was your rigid silos, a more collaborative space, but basically just sharing between each other in the organization. And then we have this open business, which is social business. And that's what open leadership's about. So who are these random people? Anybody. Okay, because if you, you didn't have to tell them you were the top dog of a certain company, but if you're on the cow train and someone's talking about your company, listen. You know, it's like when you're buying a car, don't listen to the salesman, listen to the mechanic. <laughs> okay? And don't, you don't have to be, you know, if you're buying a Jaguar, you don't have to be buying, or one of the cars, you don't have to be buying, speak to that mechanic, just speak to the other mechanics and ask them what they think of those cars. Because their friends are in that circle and they'll be able to give you the feedback you need. So be open to external and internal and everything that can happen, listen. And the only way you're going to be able to listen to people is when they trust you. So, you know, when you open and when you random, they start trusting you and they start talking to you. And then just realize what is given to you in trust and what is not. You know, there's a Facebook story. A friend of mine, Sean, his daughter has a 16th birthday and they've got a little plot and they have a little copy on the plot. So they decide they're going to go up to the copy on the plot, and they're going to have a little party. So he has, he's on Facebook, he's quite cool, okay, with all his 16-year-old daughter and her friends and all that, and what happens? Sean notices that they're smoking a bit there. You know, the good stuff. <laughs> okay, and what does Sean do? He reacts. And all that happens to Sean, in reality, is he loses 34 friends. <laughs> because what you've got to understand about when we talk about open and random and supportive is that there is no hierarchy there. Okay? When you arrive, you do not arrive as dad. You do not arrive as a celebrity. You do not arrive, even if you are the boss, you do not arrive as the boss. And that is online with people, people don't care what you are, okay? They want to know who you are, but not who you think you are or who you've been told you are. You know, I've been told I'm the president of the company. Sure, okay. So what does that make you? Probably nothing <laughs> because you've never learned how to show up in your uniqueness, okay? And that's what it's all about. So this whole open, random is just showing up in your uniqueness. Who are you? And if, if you know who you are, 
then you'll be more effective to the others. Because our biggest problem with leaders is their own insecurity. So what you notice out there, okay, and everything's a mirror, so you notice their insecurity, and that's why I say, don't criticize there, because it's probably happening in your own thing, because you're noticing it. Okay? So just make sure, there'll always be bad, difficult people, but make sure that you've been different. You know, we talk about things like triple bottom lines and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> if, if you want to know, has the world changed? Yes, the world has changed. You have to become a responsible citizen before and not after you've made the money. Okay. And, that, and you know, at the, at the same time, leadership is, has also changed. Because people want to know how you're serving them before they're going to follow you. Right. That's all it is. So open leadership is very simple. How are you serving others? They will then follow you. You see, for many years, we've paid people to come with their hands. But if you just touched their hearts, they'd come with everything. And then you will have innovation, there'll be creativity, and all those things. And it starts with you. See, EQ is really the new superpower. And I want to give you a little simple lesson in EQ. And I've, I've tried to simplify it as much as possible. So that, and I call this the emotional code. It's very simple. It starts with love, and the opposite of love is, not hate, fear. Because it's fear that causes you to hate. Okay? Again, looking at the opposites of things. When we understand the opposites of things, we, we can work emotionally with people. We can understand them. At the bottom, in the fear quadrant, is your ego system. Okay? We're all there. Right? That's where we are as people. We, everything we do is kind of like driven by force. It's not a choice. It's just who we are. The interesting thing is that when we, we keep thinking about ourselves, we fill ourselves with pride, which doesn't serve anybody but ourselves. When we talk about transformation, and you know, it was interesting you mentioned transformational leadership earlier. But if you look at this model, here you are in your ego system thinking about yourself. Whenever you make a choice, no matter how small or big the choice is, you move yourself up into an area where you can be kind. Otherwise, you're just being right. You're in your own ego system. Or you can, be, you can be decide to be kind. So being kind is listening to the other person. It's all those random things that we, the random, what other ones? Supportive and open. That's, what's mo that's, where, that's why I liked Thomas's model. Because it's all about choice. Everything you have to do, if you want to be open, it's about a choice. You've made a choice to be open and listen to other people. You've made a choice to open your door. You've made a choice to hear other people. You've made a choice to allow criticism to come your way without reacting to it. Okay? You, otherwise, you're, if the criticism comes your way, it just smacks your pride and you're back in conflict. Okay? So it's always about a choice. And that's where the transformation begins. Listen. Who knows what the opposite of listen is? Reply. Re reply. Okay. Any other guesses? Talking. Okay. Now we, we, what we're doing here is we, it's not wrong, because there's no wrongs, okay? But Think about this. Let me put it to you. See, and this is why it's always important to go take it back to your relationship. Okay? Because everything's a basic relationship. The best relationships we know and, and the most challenging relationships often are the ones we have with our partners. If you weren't listening to your partner, what would they be doing? Listening to you. 
Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we hope so. <laughs> yeah. Ignoring them. If you, and if you ignore them, what happens? Okay? There's some chaos. And there's some disruptions. And they normally shout and scream. You see, so in this emotional curve, okay, we can say, if you're not listening, the other person's trying to get your attention, and they're disruptive, they're probably shouting and screaming. Because you're not listening. You know, that's what they normally say. You're not listening to me. Okay? Okay, I'm the only one that heard it. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Right. So, you, you see, this is why I showed you the opposite of leaders. When we, we understand what the opposite is, it's always about a choice. Automatically make the choice, you automatically put yourself into a potentially good emotional state. Okay? The other person says something about you, they criticize you, you can choose to eat the chicken, spit out the bones, or you can simply become offended. Very simple. Okay? It's your choice. But it's only when you make the choice that you actually become kind. There's empathy. And empathy is an interesting one because, you know, remember I told you if you don't understand how you're operating as a person, and if you don't understand what's happening at work, most of us, unfortunately, at work give sympathy and not empathy. You know, they, your friend comes in and she goes, oh, oh my back's sore. And you go, oh, shame, did you take a pill? Oh, no. Okay, have you got a pill for me? Yeah. And then tomorrow, what happens? Same thing, same thing, same thing. It just perpetuates. Now, that, when we know that happens. If that was your child, what would you do? Huh? You find out why, you take them to the doctor. So why aren't you telling your friend to go to the doctor? It's as simple as that. Okay, we listen to people, but we don't listen to them. We, we're not proactive, we just sort of kind of like reactive. Now in the leadership space, in the self-leadership space especially, if you're not being proactive, you might be reactive, but reactive unfortunately is a bit like procrastination. Because that's like your partner saying, I love you, babes. Hmm? What's that? <laughs> ne oh, and then next week you come in. Oh, I love you, babes. He says, yeah, well, you still owe me one from last week because, you, you know, I said something to you last week and you didn't even react. Okay? Leadership. What are we doing? How are we being proactive? We see they need some attention. That's what leaders are about. Someone needs something. You need to serve them. Your partner needs something. You need to serve your partner. Because you see it happening in front of you. You didn't need a manual. You felt it. Okay? That's what open leadership's about. Who thinks this is difficult? There we are. Who else wants to be honest? <laughs> Is this a rough one, guys? Hey? You know? This, but this is really what it's about. Because we, we mustn't think that any theory in leadership that we've learned previously is going to help us because we're leading people. We're not leading machines. If you've got a machine, you can micromanage the machine. Okay? You can put all the little checks and balances there. You can let it send you a report on your cell phone every hour or every half an hour. Okay? But what do people want? They don't want to be micromanaged. They want to know that you understood them. They want to know that you saw something that they needed before they even thought about it. We can't do it to everyone. But we can do it to a few. You know? and, and that's the difference. We can do it to a few. See, the interesting thing is we, we cannot motivate anybody. Okay? All we can do is show them empathy. And when we show people empathy, because we've aligned ourselves with their situation, then they're able to bring themselves up 
to motivate themselves. And motivate means you're taking yourself to a place where you can make a choice. If you're not making a choice, you still need inspiration. If you can take yourself a choice, you have been motivated, you've motivated yourself. No one else motivated you. Okay? And it's empathy that does that. Jim Rowan has seven leadership rules. And you can, you know, strong, not rude. Kind, not weak. Bold, not a bully. Humble, but not timid. Proud, but not arrogant. Humor without folly. And probably what I've been talking about all the time is the realities and the truth. See, people know your truth. Okay? Because... 80% of our communication is emotional. So when you see something and you decide not to react on what you saw, the other person sees that. They don't, but they don't always see it in the, in, in the in, you know, they don't see it in the moment, but it goes into their subconscious. And then suddenly they think, but, but why am I feeling that way about the person? So even if you can't do this at work, Okay, it might just help you with your children and your partners. If you get it right there, you can start letting this edge over into the work environment. But that's the only way, and what I notice is that's the only way we can become leaders, is when we start realizing that we've got real people to deal with, with real emotions. Without that, we've got very little. You know, this, this quote by... Marianne Williamson, and, and I think Mandela did this in his inaugural speech as well, but it's, we, we've got to get over the fear that we have that we can be effective in the lives of other people. Because that's really what's happening. Is we've been given this unique ability to make a difference in the lives of other people. You see, people often think leadership is about changing the world. Well, the, you know, in that reality... There is no world. There's only like six or seven billion different ideas of reality. So if you don't come along one side in one person and understand what their reality is and start making a difference in their lives, you'll never change the world. It's as simple as that. So, not simple. It is a challenge. But I thank you for listening. Thanks very much. <laughs>